Welcome back. In this video, I'm going to discuss the basic types of investment funds. So I'll start off by introducing the broad managed fund types. Uh, then I'll talk about the basic characteristics of each type. And then finally, we'll take a look at the assets under management for each different type of investment fund. So what exists out there in the world of managed funds? Well, this list is by no means comprehensive, but we have a huge number of managed funds out there. You may be a little less familiar with unit investment trusts or UITs, but they are probably our oldest type of managed funds out there. They're also one of our most basic. We also have what are called REITs, R-E-I-T, so real estate investment trusts. And REITs, I'll go into obviously more detail on these, but these are basic trusts that hold primarily real estate assets or mortgages. We also have mutual funds. Again, I'm going to go into way more detail on these. Uh, Exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, which I'm sure a few of you are already familiar with. These are essentially managed portfolios that have very low expense ratios. Hedge funds, these are the wild west of funds. These are funds that can invest in pretty much anything. We can also have sovereign wealth funds, and these have become prominent in the last 20 years. Essentially, if a government has an excess of cash, it might actually start a sovereign wealth fund, and that fund will invest in assets, say, like soccer teams or individual securities. Uh, it's a way for a government that has excess cash right now or that runs a budget surplus to essentially do something productive with those funds. So they'll invest in assets that could yield a return that can be returned to the government. We also have money market funds, and these operate a lot like mutual funds. They're just short-term funds. They primarily invest in money market securities. We also have pension funds and private funds, so private equity funds primarily. Okay, so let's start off with the most basic of these types, the UIT. Now, UIT is a fund that holds a fixed portfolio of similar assets. Once the UIT, or Unit Investment Trust, is created and it invests in certain assets, that's exactly what it holds. It really doesn't change. So these things are passively managed, and it might be, for example, the 10 stocks with the largest market cap on January 1st of the start of 2024. Uh, so whatever those 10 stocks were, those are the 10 stocks that are going to remain in this portfolio. And if you want to own shares of a UIT, you buy what we call units. So this UIT, it has a portfolio containing 10 stocks, and it will sell units to what we call unit holders. Now, these UITs, you generally are going to have a trustee, and the trustee is just the person or organization that oversees the fund's assets. They, uh, they'll typically employ a manager, and it's the manager that will buy and sell the different assets uh, initially and then just oversee the process. These UITs, they're passively managed, so the expense ratio is typically quite low. Now, if you're a unit holder, what you can do if you don't want to own this particular portfolio anymore is you simply sell the shares back to the trustee. And that's pretty much it. Okay, next we have REITs. And REITs are very much like a closed-end mutual fund. The big difference here is that REITs invest primarily in real estate in uh, assets. So these are what we call a closed-end investment firm, and they invest in one of two things. Uh, these are mortgages or physical real estate properties. Now, REITs are like a lot of managed funds out there. They're what we call a pass-through investment, meaning that any income received by the REIT is passed on directly to the investors. So there's no oh, double taxation or anything like that. Uh, now, these REITs, when I say they're structured like a closed-end fund, what I mean is the REIT invests in X number of assets, and then it issues, I don't know, let's say 1,000 shares to anyone who wants to buy these, these shares. Those shares are going to trade very much like, well, stocks. I mean, the REIT will only ever have 1,000 shares. It won't create more shares five months after the REIT is created. If you want to buy those shares, you have to go out and buy them from someone who already has them on the secondary market. Now, REITs, they do come with a couple of caveats that you definitely need to know. These things really don't change, and they're just kind of like 
the things that we remember about REITs. Basically, in order for a, a managed fund to be considered a REIT, it has to have at least 100 shareholders, no five of whom can hold more than 50% of the shares between them. At least 75% of the assets have to be in real estate, cash, or U.S. treasuries. So, you know, this incentivizes the REIT to invest primarily in, you know, housing and, you know, oh, mortgages. And then REITs, any income they receive, at least 90% of that income, whether that's from uh, rent or just, uh, oh, let's say, uh, yeah, primarily rent, I'd say, uh, or, you know, just mortgage payments, uh, those REITs are going to turn at least 90% of that out in the form of a dividend to their shareholders. So uh, basically, these are the stylized characteristics of REITs. They hold a very basic portfolio of real estate assets. It's going to be primarily real estate. And then any income that the firm receives, a large portion of it is going to be paid out to the REIT shareholders. So the payout ratio for REITs is very, very high. If you want to see a good example of this, probably one of the best would be the Simon Property Group. So Simon Property Group is one of the largest REITs. It manages a lot of mall properties. So a lot of the malls in Indiana are actually owned by Simon. So if you want to see uh, what they own, you might be able to see, oh, let's see their portfolio. So their portfolio, primarily owner, operator, and developing primarily malls, premium outlets, uh, other assets. So you can actually dive into these. So uh, Roosevelt Field, I don't know exactly where that is, but yeah, I mean, these are all the malls that Simon Property Group, a REIT, owns. So College Mall in Bloomington, uh, I believe a couple of malls in Indianapolis. Yeah, Keystone, uh, Fashion Mall in Keystone, and Castleton Square, they also own. Okay, the next type of asset we have is a mutual fund. And a mutual fund, this is just a pool of assets that's managed by an investment company. Uh, typically, if you want to buy shares of a mutual fund, you are going to buy shares either you know, from an investor who already owns those shares or from the mutual fund itself. We'll talk about closed-end versus open-end mutual funds in a second. Uh, but essentially, the reason you might consider owning shares of a mutual fund, well, the, the big ones are right here. One, if you just put all your assets in a mutual fund, you've got very good record keeping. Uh, essentially, the mutual funds in the U.S. are required to keep very good records report what they own at the end of every quarter, and uh, so they, they do a pretty good job of that. They you know do a very good job of reporting their performance, what they're holding, how that lines up with their prospectus, uh, very straightforward. Mutual funds also are very often very well diversified. Uh, there's a common rule in the mutual fund industry that the fund cannot own more than 5% of, or put more than 5% of its portfolio in any asset. So, for example, a mutual fund couldn't invest more than, say, 5% of its portfolio in Apple stock. Uh, some mutual funds will do this, but a lot of them, they'll actually have a, a statement in their prospectus that says they are not allowed to uh, concentrate more than 5%. Mutual funds often also have professional management. I mean, there's going to be a professional manager, very often a CFA who's running this fund, and they do have relatively low transaction costs, which are getting lower and lower all the time. Now, with mutual funds, there's two broad types. We have closed-end and open-end mutual funds. And closed-end funds, these are funds with a fixed number of shares, kind of like that uh, the unit investment trust I mentioned. Basically, the fund, when it's created, it's created with, let's say, 1,000 shares. It will never create more shares and it's never going to redeem those shares. So if you want to buy shares of this mutual fund after it's created, you have to go out and buy them from someone who already owns shares. Uh, so that's the thing. Uh, old investors cash out by selling to new investors. Uh, the shares will trade on an exchange, uh, NYSE, NASDAQ, whatever. Uh, and then one of the most important characteristics of these closed-end mutual funds is that they can actually trade at a premium or a discount to the underlying value of the portfolio assets called the net asset value or NAV. Basically, your NAV is the uh, total value of the portfolio held by the closed-end fund divided by the number of shares that the closed-end fund has issued. And very often, these closed-end funds, they'll sell at a discount 
to the NAV. You can think of the NAV as the intrinsic value of the mutual fund. Uh, so, you know, very often, one of the big reasons we say that these, these funds are undervalued is because maybe uh, investors have issues with the quality of the management, or more likely, and I think this is definitely true, it's liquidity fears. What if someone isn't willing to buy my mutual fund shares if I want to sell out? So let me show you this. So this is a graph that I put together of the, uh, or that I found, I didn't put this together uh, myself, but basically it shows the closed end discount or the closed end fund discount over time, going back to about 2003. Uh, what you can see is that, you know, right here at zero, this is the point where the share price of the closed end fund's shares are equal to the NAV per share. Basically, this line right here at zero indicates that these shares are fairly valued or they're valued at the NAV. But most of the time, these closed end funds, they trade at a discount to NAV. So the question is why? Well, I think that the easiest thing to understand is it happens if you look at, oh, say, the start of the financial crisis or the start of COVID. I mean, quite frankly, during periods where investors are very skittish about liquidity concerns, you know, they, they don't think they're going to be able to cash out and sell their shares to another investor at a fair price, that's where the value of these, these uh, closed-end funds tends to fall. Uh, so typically when there's a lot of illiquidity in the market, that's where we see the largest closed-end fund discounts. Okay, so I mentioned closed-end mutual funds. Now we'll talk about the, the more prominent version of mutual funds called open-end funds. And the big difference between closed-end funds and open-end funds is that open-end funds, uh, these are funds where the investors buy their shares always directly from the mutual fund. The mutual fund will uh, they'll sell the shares directly to the investor, and then if the investor wants to sell their shares, uh, they'll sell those shares back to the mutual fund itself. In other words, these open-end funds, they can create as many shares as they want. And because the mutual fund is just increasing and decreasing the number of shares, uh, these things are usually going to be priced at NAV. Uh, generally, if you contribute funds to a mutual fund, the mutual fund is going to go out and buy more shares of the underlying portfolio to keep track of you know, how much has been invested. Now, broadly, whenever we hear the term mutual fund, it's these open-end mutual funds that we very often think of. So anytime you've heard of uh, the term mutual fund, these are the type of funds that we're typically thinking of. Uh, the only time you'll ever really talk about a closed-end mutual fund is if you hear the term closed-end fund. Uh, so there's, there is that, that distinction that I have to make in the industry. Uh, now, these, these open-end funds they are significantly larger on average than the closed-end funds. Uh, they can also see some massive capital inflows when they outperform the market. So if you're a mutual fund manager who does really well, you know, your fund offers a, a significant positive alpha for many quarters or a couple of years in a row, investors are going to flock to your fund because they see that you have skill. And when that happens, you're going to see it, you know, this, these capital inflows are going to require you to go out and buy new shares of the stocks or bonds already in your portfolio, and the fund will grow, and admittedly, the total fees that you collect as the mutual fund or fund manager will also grow. So there's an incentive here for mutual fund managers to outperform the market because the more funds they have or the more assets under management they have, the greater their total fee that they can charge. So the, fun, the fee is usually a percentage of uh, the, the total assets under management. And usually we compare our, our mutual fund performance to some benchmark, like the Lipper averages or the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ QQQ. Okay, so that's that. Next we have ETFs. And ETFs, these are much simpler. ETFs simply track a basket of goods, a basket of assets. Very often, it's a, a stock index like the S&P 500 or maybe the NASDAQ QQQ. But the key difference between ETFs and a lot of mutual funds is that ETFs are passively managed. You're 
average manager of an ETF is really just making sure that they're buying and selling uh, to meet customer demand. They're not actively valuing individual securities. Now, there are some advantages to ETFs. Uh, unlike open-end funds where the trades will happen at the end of the day, typically, these ETFs, they trade continuously throughout the day. So they're a lot like stocks. You'll see the price increase or decrease while the market is open. You can also short sell or buy these ETFs on margin. So you can buy the NASDAQ QQQ, which is an ETF, on margin, or you can short it. Uh, because these things are passively managed, they don't have as many analysts, and therefore they have lower costs, so a lower expense ratio. And they are you know, somewhat tax efficient, uh, just because they're holding assets for a fairly long time. Uh, and then there are some pretty big disadvantages. Uh, because these ETFs, they're, they're trading just like stocks, their price can actually divert or divert from the NAV, because the NAV is just the value of the underlying assets in the ETF's portfolio. And investors can actually bid up the price of the S&P 500 ETF beyond the NAV. Uh, so, you know, it's possible you get a premium to net asset value for these ETFs. And ETFs, they typically have to be purchased from a broker. Okay, so how have these investments grown or shrank over the years? So these managed funds, how many of them have, uh, have we seen an increase? Well, what we've seen is that UITs, or Unit Investment Trusts, they used to be the most prominent type of managed fund out there. They have dramatically fallen in, you know, by, by number of funds uh, in the last 20 years. Mutual funds, they've held relatively constant. Uh, the number of mutual funds in the U.S. has historically been, I mean, somewhere around this. If you add up, like, worldwide mutual funds, you might get to, like, 15,000, 16,000. I mean, quite frankly, there's more mutual funds in the world or in the U.S. and Europe than there are individual stocks, if that says anything. Uh, down here, we have the closed-end funds. There's very few actual closed-end funds. I mean, these closed-end funds, you know, they're, they're smaller, they're a little more archaic, uh, but, you know, they, they still do exist. The rise here has been from ETFs. I mean, there's a huge number of ETFs nowadays, mostly because they're, you know, a, a fund family can set up a large number of ETFs and, you know, they don't need a bunch of managers and uh, they can create an ETF that does well, practically anything they want uh, as long as it's passively managed. So we've seen this massive rise in ETFs by just sheer number and then uh, assets under management have also increased. So here's a graph of assets under management by uh, investment type annually going back oh, 20 years or so, what you can see is that mutual funds uh, in blue dominate this market. I mean, the number of, or the total assets under management in mutual funds is just enormous. It's only recently that we've seen this slighter increase in ETFs. And I'm not sure this graph does it justice because ETFs, they're passively managed, but you can also have mutual funds that are passively managed. And for the first time ever, I think uh, this year, uh, more assets were passively managed than actively managed. So, uh, you know, a small portion of the total AUM of, you know, these four types is in closed-end funds and UITs. Uh, the amount in ETFs is increasing, and mutual funds are losing market share, although, you know, there's a huge diversity in these mutual funds. Some are active, some are passive. Okay, next we have hedge funds. And hedge funds, these are, like I said, they're kind of the wild west of in investment. Basically, they're just an investment fund that pools capital from a limited number of accredited investors. So these accredited investors, I have it down here, uh, in order to invest in a mutual fund, you have to meet these requirements. You have to have a net worth greater than a million, or you have to have annual income by yourself of at least $200,000 over the last three years, or... Your joint income with your spouse has to be greater than, I believe, 300000 with your spouse. Basically, hedge funds are only accessible by high net worth individuals. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, well, I'll get to the big one uh, down here in a second, but uh, these things are very often structured like a limited liability company or a limited partnership, and they're highly, highly levered. They typically 
engage in a huge number of risky strategies or just one particular risky strategy. And I mean, these things, they are, because they're far more risky, the SEC doesn't want any investor investing in these uh, funds. It's only open to investors who can afford to take a bit of risk. Uh, there are a huge number of hedge funds out there. there. I'll talk about some prominent ones maybe later in the class, but there's two that you should probably be relatively familiar with. Two Sigma is a company that trades or that uses uh, quantitative techniques. So the, the factor uh, sorting that we talked about I think a couple chapters ago, uh, basically two sigma. They they look for statistics that when you sort your portfolio on, or you know all the stocks in the market on, uh, generate positive or negative alpha. There's also a company out there called AQR, and AQR it's again it's a quant fund. So its strategies are you know essentially uh, very heavily tied to historical financial research. So. If I go over to equities, uh, what we can see is that you know AQR has been building portfolios that de deliver active returns. Uh, they use a, a huge number of techniques, so they might just use a, a specific style, like a defensive or a momentum style. So mo remember, momentum is one of the primary uh, factor techniques or you know sorting techniques that we can do. Invest in high momentum stocks, short low momentum stocks. You can also uh, build portfolios on multiple different uh, strategies, so maybe like book to market and size. Uh, you can also do things like sorting portfolios based on three different uh, uh, strategies or factors that have been found to generate positive alpha. So uh, AQR, they have a huge number of strategies that use uh, oh, a variety of techniques and to generate positive alpha here. Okay, so... Uh, these things are private companies. They, you know, they can make a large number of trades. Uh, they're not bound by the same regulations as mutual funds. Mutual funds have to report their holdings quarterly, and they have to make their prospectus available publicly. Uh, not so with hedge funds. Hedge funds, they don't have to disclose their portfolio really ever. I mean, even if you're an investor in a hedge fund, you might not know what the hedge fund is holding for, I mean, maybe until six months after, uh, you know, after the fact. Uh, so these hedge funds, they're kind of black boxes. We don't really know what the hedge fund is holding, and that's by design. The hedge fund might be, you know, taking some strategy that uh, wouldn't pay off if a bunch of other investors made the same strategy. Uh, so there's kind of this, this first mover advantage here. Uh, now, one other thing that you should know about hedge funds is that uh, historically, the hedge fund's general partner, so in a, a limited partnership, there's always going to be one general partner. That's the person or organization running the hedge fund. Uh, they're, historically, they would take a sizable portion of the profits. There's this term out there called 2 and 20. And 2 and 20 essentially means that the expense ratio an annually for a lot of these hedge funds was 2% of the assets that were being managed and 20% of the profits generated. So, you know, what this says is, you know, these hedge funds, they're, they're making a lot more off of fees than mutual funds and ETFs are. I mean, 2% of the funds in the portfolio plus 20% of the profits. Nowadays, this 2 and 20 rule has, has pretty much gone by the wayside. A lot of hedge, hedge funds are taking like maybe a 1% and maybe a 10% of profits, so one in ten is what that would be called, but eh, times change. So by and large, these hedge funds, they are far more risky than mutual funds. They engage in much crazier strategies. Uh, I'll show you a couple of these strategies in class, uh, but you know, quite frankly, you wouldn't want to just build your entire portfolio on hedge funds. They're a way to diversify your portfolio individually. Okay, so let's summarize. There are many types of investment funds, each with specific characteristics. I mean, I think we get a pretty good sense of that. There's all kinds of things out there. Some of them, like sovereign wealth funds or pension funds, I really didn't go into any detail on. Uh, some funds are passively managed, while others are actively managed. I think passive management has become much more prominent in the last 20 years, but active management, it still absolutely plays a role. 
Uh, ETFs are absolutely increasing in popularity. That's been a trend for, again, the last 20 or 25 years. And hedge funds are kind of, like I said, I'll say it one last time, they are the wild west of the investment industry, uh, them and private equity funds. Basically, if we have a hedge fund, it can engage in just about any trading strategy it wants, and it's very, very uh, opaque. It's, it's not transparent at all. Okay, so with that, I'm going to conclude, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thank you.